chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. By the way, with our Wednesday night uh, Bible study and prayer meeting, starting the first Wednesday in January, our intention is, because we'll be finishing the book of John, our intention is to do a topical series on the subject of end times, because it seems like everybody's interested in that subject right now, considering all the events that are going on around us. So we'll be doing a biblical theology of what the Bible says prophetically about the last days. And um, I'm really excited about that. And so if you haven't been coming out, you've been wondering about it, you've been, you know, wanting maybe to uh, think about that, that's something you might want to look forward to. After the holidays, first Wednesday in January, we'll be switching our focus to, uh, to eschatology. Okay, Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Last week, remember, uh, you know, all that we had gone over with Abram having defeated the four kings from the east and and, uh, you know, the Lord having met with him out in the valley, the, you know, the, the, the mysterious character Melchizedek and, and how uh, we tried to define who he is. And, you know, people fall on, on, on various sides of, the, of who Melchizedek is or was. Um, doesn't matter so much what you believe concerning who he is or was. Uh, but we did look at that, and we also looked at the subject of giving and tithing and so on and so forth because we found that as, as a first reference. There's a couple more first references today in this message, uh, which we will see. The word righteousness is introduced for the first time in the Bible. Uh, the word believe is introduced for the first time in the Bible. And so we're going to look at those things. And as I'm going to mention this again, I want to mention this to you now, as I've thought about this message, and, and I've been kind of looking ahead at this message for probably... I don't know, four, five, six weeks I've been thinking about, because there's a, there's a verse in this chapter that is one of those pillars, you know, that hold up the temple. It's just this massive marble pillar of importance in, in theology, in, in relating to God, your relationship with the Lord. Uh, there's a massive pillar in this chapter, and I'm going to, primarily the message is going to be surrounding that, that particular verse. And it goes something like this, and, and I'm not one as you've probably noticed, I'm not one to title messages. I just, you know, some pastors, they'll, every Sunday, the title of today's message is, and, or, the, or right in the bulletin, it'll have the title of the message. That's just never been me, because, I don't know, for me, it seems forced. It just seems like, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like it's something that I would do. So I, I usually don't do it, but there's been this theme and this phrase that has continuously surrounded this chapter as I've thought so much about it, and, uh, and I've actually used it in counseling a couple times over the past few weeks. And so I really felt like it was inspired, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to memorize it and wanted me to share it with you, and so I'm going to get to it again, but I'll share it with you right now, and that is simply this. Righteousness is not something to be achieved. It's something to be believed. I'm going to say it again, and I will repeat it several times. Righteousness is not something to be achieved. It's something to be believed. And if you get a grip on this, It'll radically, radically, radically change your life and your relationship with the Lord. It has for me. It's the one thing that I must say that uh, the Calvary Chapel Church movement has given to me is an idea of what that phrase actually means, how it's lived out in the life of the believer. Righteousness is not something to be achieved. It's something to be believed. Let's look at this. Verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying... Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, God says a couple things here. The first thing he says is, and he's coming in a vision, by the way, and he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why is it that Abram would be afraid here? What is it that God is warning him about not to be afraid from? Well, keep in mind where we just came from, as I previously mentioned, he had just recently defeated the kings of the east and any time you come against an army and go out to battle and you, you, uh, you surprise your army, these armies had no clue who Abram was, had, were not expecting him. This was a complete surprise to them. And so for, from their perspective, this is a completely new enemy, Abram and his men and his, you know, and his people. And, and so now they've gone home, sort of tail between their legs, licking their wounds, and vengeance is in their hearts. Is it not? And so anytime there's a defeat over an enemy, uh, that enemy is probably going to be scheming how to come back after you again. And I think Abram knows this, okay? Now, if you, if you consider this from Abram's perspective, there's that temptation to fear because at this point, now we remember there were how many men that Abram had with him? 
318, very good. And so if you remember that 318, and then think about how many people Abram had in his quote-unquote household at that time. Well, if there were 318, if you just uh, guesstimate, you know, add another two for every one of those, because many of those men were married with kids. Some of them might have still been single young men. But if you add two, a wife and a child, average for each one of those men represented, he had probably close to 900 or more people in his household. He's, he's got a village. When he came back from Egypt, we're going to find out some of the people. We're going to be introduced to someone that came with him out of Egypt, by the way, a woman by the name of Hagar next week. But he took with him many people, and people have been born in his household and so on and so forth. This is not just Abram and, you know, Sarai and, and you know, a few people. This is, this is a major deal now. He's got great wealth. He's the leader over a great number of people. It's basically a village, okay? A large village uh, is what he's got here. And so with that in mind, now you think about that. In that time, they would call that, they would actually probably refer to that as a city. That would be a city to them. And you hear about the cities of... of uh, you know, you hear about the cities of, uh, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah that he actually defended, uh, we talked about last week. But, you know, Abram here has got a lot of responsibility. Now, unlike those other cities, a lot of these other cities would build walls around them for protection. Abram hasn't done that here. He's not picked one small spot, said this is our, where we're going to dwell. In fact, God has given him a great deal more than that and, uh, in terms of land. And it's told him to walk around and, you know, possess this land. This is yours. And he's going to reiterate that again in this chapter. But he has, doesn't have that kind of protection. He doesn't have those walls and the gates and all that stuff. And so you could see the temptation. He, he, he realizes the responsibility of shepherding this great flock of people. But at the same time, physically speaking, there's no sense of protection. There are no walls. But God tells him here not to be afraid. And in fact, I believe that he has that very same message for us as Christians. And I think that we, that's, that's another theme of this chapter that we have to embrace. And, and then the question naturally begs asking, well, what do we have to be afraid of? And I don't think I really even have to ask that question today. You know, the things that are going on in the world around us and, and everything that's, that's coming uh, down the pipe here in the near future that we can foresee can stir a great deal of fear within our hearts from a spiritual sense, from a physical sense. In every way, there's a good deal of things that we can, if we let ourselves, indulge ourselves, we can be afraid of. But God says not to, and He says, in fact, that I will be or I am your shield. Your shield. What is a shield for? I mean, if you can imagine the one you the, the army uh, would put on their arm, they would have a shield on one arm and a sword in the other hand, correct? And, and when the enemy came and was, was uh, hurling arrows or, or swinging battle axes or swinging swords at you, you would put the shield up and it would take the blows, right? It always went in front of you. Have you thought about God in that sense, that He goes before you in everything in your life? He is before you. He's between you and the world. If, in fact, you're walking with Him, He is your shield, and He doesn't stop there. I know sometimes, by the way, it doesn't feel like He's our shield. But maybe sometimes we ought to ask ourselves this question, on what side of the shield are we standing? Have we walked ahead of the shield, and we're kind of dragging it behind us, or are we using that shield to keep between us and the world? But He's not only our shield, as I mentioned, He's also our exceedingly great reward. And he says that to Abram, I'm, your, I'm also your exceedingly great reward. Exceedingly great reward is a relationship with God aside from eternal promise, which is certainly part of it. It is also a reward in and of itself, the relationship that we have with Him. It's an exceedingly great reward. It's, it's beyond measure. We in our finite uh, minds are incapable of fully realizing what, it, what kind of reward that we have in a relationship with God. In fact, we don't fully possess all the reward that we have in our relationship with God day by day, do we? I think we, f we leave a lot on the table, in a sense. You know, we come away from the negotiating table, God says, I've given you all this, and, and we, we've got this, you know, we, whatever we can carry in this little bit right here, that's about it. 
But there's so much more for us, and it's an exceedingly great reward if we would only figure out how to take advantage of it. There's so much that we have daily. I'll tell you one major thing we have. We were talking about this, I think it was Wednesday night. We have peace. We have peace, and we have a peace not as the world has a peace, because sometimes the world has a type of peace. We have a peace that the Bible defines as surpassing all human wisdom and understanding, right? What kind of peace can surpass all human wisdom and understanding? It's a kind of peace that's supernatural, that's not human, and it comes from knowing that the creator of all things that we know, the the entire universe, is sort of said to us, you're okay with me. We've got a good relationship. I've forgiven you of your sins. I no longer see you as an enemy of mine. I no longer see you as a sinner. I see you as forgiven in my son. Abram has his exceedingly great reward. Nonetheless, his, in his flesh, he still fears. And I, it's the very same thing we battle with. We have to acknowledge that the motions are real. Even though God has promised us, we still fear. Verse 2. Abram's response, he said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Now, we remember that God had already promised Abram two things, right? He had promised him a land. He promised him a huge amount of property. I'm going to bring you to a place, and it's going to be a great big piece of property, and it's going to be yours. And, And he also promised him that he would exceedingly abundantly uh, multiply his seed and make him a great nation, he said, a nation after his own heart, a nation of his own people. And Abram here is sort of reminding the Lord that, you know, I still don't have a child. Here I am, I'm 76 years old at this point, and, and my wife is about 66. There was about 10 years difference. These are estimates, by the way, some disagree. But certainly Abram was right around 80 years old, and Sarah was right around... 70. And in all their years of marriage, uh, she had still not conceived. And no doubt they had been trying. And Abraham sort of is coming to the Lord and saying, what what are you going to give me, Lord? I mean, you promised me. Here's the land. You've blessed me with a tremendous amount of wealth and accumulated many things here. I've got all these people. I've got all this oxen. I've got all this stuff. And really the jewel that I've set my heart on is the son you've promised me, Lord. Where's my son? Abram also said in verse 3, Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one is born in my house as my heir. You see, in Abram's day, in his culture, it was customary to build your family. And since there, you know, obviously, as we talked about, there's vulnerability that Abram is faced with. He's he's got this huge house to take care of. And and it's like, well, when I die, I'm 80 years old, who is going to take over and carry this stuff on. You know, who, who is going to take control? Who is going to take the helm here? He doesn't have anyone. And so he's looking for his, at this point, his right-hand man is, is Eleazar the, of Damascus. And, and Lord, he obviously is in line to take over all the stuff and to be responsible for all this land. You know, and I see in this, Abram's heart, I see a good model, I, in a sense, for the church. I'm not saying this is a type here. I'm just saying I see something interesting. Abram has a village-building mentality. He's not not like, well, this, you know, okay, I've got all these people. They've all come with me. This is my tent here. And, you know, you guys have your tents over there. And, you know, if you show up for work today, that's fine. And, you know, if you don't show up for work, that's fine too. You know, go start your own village. It's not like that. It's like he cares about every single tent in his village. Every family is part of his family. And, and it's like they're trying to build a community. They're trying to build a village, and, and he feels vulnerable. And he's like, Lord, where's my heir? Where's the one who's going to have inherit not only just the stuff and the responsibility, but inherit the vision and the promise that you've given me? It's kind of like the church. And he says verse, in verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abram, saying, This one, Eleazar, shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. God's promise was, and it had been since before, 
that he would raise up a nation from specifically from Abram's seed. And further than that, even looking way down in the distance, that the Messiah would also come from Abram's seed. And although he was 76 years old, Abram was still not too old to have. I, I think oftentimes we, re, we look back at this and say, man, how can he have kids? And how can Sarah have kids at this age? And, and certainly they were starting to think that way. But by the same token, remember, at this time, we still have, um, well, let's see. Uh, I think it was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, which one of them? Some, one of them was still alive at this point. Shem was still alive at this point, if I'm not mistaken. So what's that, 400 and something years later? So we have people were still living a long time at this time. So it wasn't a completely foreign thought, although Abram certainly accepted the fact that he was aging faster than Shem. So I'm sure at this point that he realizes, you know, the aging process is speeding up. There's a lot of weird stuff going on that we don't think about at this time. They're aware that people used to live 900 years. They know that. You know, and it wasn't so far away that it was such a foreign thought to them. You wonder what they, why they thought that changed, right? And I think last, last week I might have said Seth, didn't I? Did anybody pick up on that, by the way? I mentioned Seth. If you listen to last week's message, um, I mentioned that Seth, Seth might have still been alive. <laughs> it was actually Shem, and, and so I, I apologize for that. But so Shem is still alive. Now Abram here is like, where's my son, Lord? You promised me a son and a nation. You know, where is the offspring? Where is the seed of my loins? Where is this nation that you're going to raise up through, through me? And he's almost 80. He's around 80 years old. And then the Lord brought him outside in verse 5. And, five and, and, and obviously it's evening, or at least it's dusk. And he says to Abram, now look toward heaven. Look up. And count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Verse 6, I want you to underline that in your Bibles. If you're one who does that, if you mark your Bibles, verse 6 should be one of those verses that's either highlighted or underlined and memorized in your heart, because this is how righteousness is obtained, through believing God. Not through your actions. Your actions can only be a manifestation of what you believe. Amen? God brings him outside and says, look toward heaven. When your heart sinks out of concern and care for your future, your response should be to look up. Right? Look up. Look toward God. He's the one who has the answers. So righteousness, as I mentioned earlier, is not something to be achieved. Let me define that a little bit as, before we go forward here. Abram believes God, and it says here, God accounted it, or some translations might say reckoned it. I think that's New American Standard if you read that one. And what is it? Who has King James? What does King James say? Anybody? Where's John? What do you got, John? Verse 6, God counted it, right? It's an accounting term, and, and it means to, it, it, to put it on your account. It means, if you think of it in terms of a bank account, it's like you had nothing. All of a sudden, you have everything in your bank account in terms of righteousness, okay? The, uh, the object here is uh, we've all come here to church to worship God, and what we know is what we need to have a relationship with God is righteousness. How do we know that? Well, later on, after Abram is, is uh, long since gone, uh, God gives the law. And he said in the Old Covenant that in order to have a, you know, eternal relationship with him, you had, to, you, you had to, or not an eternal relationship, in order to have a relationship with him on earth, you had to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. And so, you know, we know here that there was a need for righteousness because God had always, you know, intended for that to be the nature of the relationship between us and him because that's what broke the relationship. We go back to Genesis chapter 2 and 3 and 4, and we see how, the, you know, sin came in. Chapter 3, sin came, and the relationship with God was broken. Righteousness, righteousness is what is needed. We need that righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it's accounted. It's put on his account. All of a sudden, he has righteousness, whereas before he didn't. He has righteousness, not because he's a good guy, not because he does the right thing, not, listen to this, 
listen to this very carefully, not because he built altars, not because he, you know, knelt down at those altars and bowed his head and prayed, not because he went out in the valley and defeated the four kings from the east. It's not for any of those reasons. It's only because he believed God. He believed God. What do I mean by righteousness is not something to be achieved? In our flesh, it is our natural tendency to, because we want to please God, it's, that's good, that's in the spirit, we want to please God, right? But our natural tendency, because of that d- desire in our flesh, is to produce good works, right? We, we have this desire, and in fact, we ha- it goes even further than that, and this is rooted in pride, but we have a desire to feel as though there's some value in and of ourselves. It's very fleshly. We want to feel like God's getting something in exchange for what He's given us, don't we? We want to feel like that in every relationship. In fact, you know, as husbands, I think we think, uh, you know, our wives got the better deal, right? <laughs> look what she got. Oh, look what I bring to the table, after all. And there's, there's a sense of that, and I'm sure it's very subtle, but there's a sense of that in the relationship with God. Boy, God, you know, you did good when you got me, you know? <laughs> it doesn't even sound right saying it, does it? It's hard to say it. But there is the flesh. That's the flesh's perspective. But in fact, it doesn't work that way, does it? In fact, if you look at Romans chapter 7, you'll find that the flesh, in the flesh dwells, no, in fact, the only thing that dwells in the flesh is sin, Right? The only thing that the flesh can accomplish on its own is sin. And so, as a human nature, our flesh will desire to manufacture righteousness because we want to feel as though we've earned or deserved the salvation and the relationship that we have in God. It's your natural tendency. It's something you battle against your entire life. It's just the way it is. So righteousness is not something to be achieved, and that word achieved assumes the idea of the fleshly effort to produce righteousness, and instead it's something to be believed. Isaiah said this, chapter 45, verses 23 through 24. The word has gone out of my mouth, God speaking. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. God is saying, I possess righteousness and strength. The righteous, who, the, those who desire to be righteous, shall come to me for it. Belief in the promises of God that he gives us in his holy word is what saved us. Belief in the promises of God and His Holy Word, by the way, is also what sanctifies us. Once we're saved, I think it's, you know, that's when the problems really start. I, well, I, I shouldn't say that. Most people who are truly saved, if you're in this room today and you, def, and you have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, you've come to that place where, you know, where you've accepted God and you, who He is, what He offers. You've come to the realization that you can't save yourself Jesus is the only way to heaven, and so on and so forth. You've recognized that you can't earn salvation because if you haven't recognized that yet, well, then you're you're not saved because you're putting forth your own effort in terms of your own salvation. You can't do that. So I think salvation by grace through faith, Ephesians says, is something that most of us sort of get a grip on, right? We understand that in the saving relationship with God, it's, it's all Him and not us. Nothing we can do to earn or deserve it. But it's after that, it's the relationship as it continues on with God that we start to think that we have to follow the righteous requirements of the law, all 613 of them. And as we read the Bible, it becomes this heavy burden and you get worn out and worn out and worn out and tired after year and year and year of trying to be like Jesus. It's fleshly effort. But what saved us, grace, through faith, Believing in God is the same thing that sanctifies us. The only thing that's going to change you is your belief that A, God wants you to change, B, that His Word is true and His promises are true, and C, if you don't let go and you keep pursuing Him for that change, that He will change you. 
your transformation into more into the image of Christ, Romans chapter 8, is going to come the same way you got saved. It's through belief that God's going to do that work in you. Romans 4, 19 through 2 says, or, uh, Romans 4, 19 through 24 says this. Do not be weak in faith, uh, and not being weak in faith, excuse me. This is actually speaking of, of Abram, Romans chapter 4. And Abram, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. Looking forward a little bit, as we'll get in the, we're going to get to this point in the chapter we're in, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, although we know in a sense he did. We'll see that in a minute. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Notice he, he was strengthened. He didn't strengthen himself. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that he that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake, Abram's sake alone, that it was imputed, another accounting term, it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Abram believed God, but it was only by God's ability that he even believed him. God strengthened him in his faith, giving glory to God. Hebrews says a lot about this as well. Chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. Chapter 6, verses 9 through 12 in Hebrews. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Keep in mind, this book of Hebrews is written to a bunch of uh, Jewish people who had sort of gone back to relating to God from an old covenant perspective, which is exactly the subject we're talking about, isn't it? It's like we get saved by grace through faith, we accept what Jesus is and who he, what He did for us, and then yet we go back to a legalistic way of relating to God. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though weak in this manner... For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, sluggish but imitate those who listen through faith and patience inherit the promises." Yes, if you're exposing your heart and your mind to the worship of God and to the study of His Word, and you come across all these brilliant truths, and you begin to see righteousness here, and you begin to compare yourself to that righteousness, and you see, I fall so far short of righteousness, and you see that. If you're getting tired out trying to be this, you're trying to accomplish righteousness in the flesh. In this verse, in these verses in Hebrews chapter 6, it's talking about patience, perseverance in faith, believing that God is going to transform you, not in that you can transform yourself. It's just not going to work that way. There's a lot of people who I know used to go to church every Sunday, used to be real involved, used to be used by the Lord in great many ways, and today they don't go to church anymore. They're struggling in their homes. They're struggling with this. They're struggling with that. And it's because, I believe it's primarily because of this simple, basic truth. They're trying, they, were, they formerly were trying to be something they couldn't be. And God is just sitting back there waiting for them to stop trying to be good. Now, this message could be taken the wrong way. Very easily. You could be saying, oh, wait a minute, it sounds like what you're saying is I can just go out and live any way I want, and God's just going to change me no matter what. Does that work? No. We have to try our best to cooperate with what the Holy Spirit's doing in our life, amen? Patiently, as we recognize our struggles and our sinfulness, as God reveals the things in our life that we know He wants to change, there needs to be a pursuit after righteousness, but not in the flesh. We need to get on our knees more and pray more. Not as a work of the flesh, but we need to say, Lord, you promised. Just like Abram's reminding the Lord of his promises. Lord, you promised you were going to change me. 
I want so badly for you to use me. I want your glory to be seen in my life. And the only thing, by the way, that is going to bring about His glory seen through your life is when He does a miracle in your life and He changes you. And people can say that's different because that person never could have changed unless God changed them, right? Verse 7, God says to Abram, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. God is turning his attention now. He said, look, I'm going to give you a son. It's not going to be Eleazar. I, I promised I would do that. It's, your, your descendants are going to outnumber the stars if you were able to count them. And now he turns his attention and reminds him of the second part of his promise, and I've given you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Now on the surface, you're sitting there thinking, how is he going to tempt God? <laughs> what's going on here? Is he, what's, what's he asking God? Can he just take him at his word? So God says to him, he says, how will I know, Lord? How will I know? So he said to Abram, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And then he brought all these to God, and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each one opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when, he had, when vultures had came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now, this might seem very bizarre to you, but you have to understand the culture and the time. In Abram's culture, in his time, if you wanted to establish a contract with somebody, you were going to enter into a business deal, this was a typical contract. They didn't have lawyers back then. They didn't have, you know, this kind of thing where you, where you, you know, all this paperwork was drawn up and you really couldn't understand any of it. This was easily understood. I think sometimes it'd be cool to return to this kind of thing, you know. Let's say Tony and I were entering into some business deal. We would bring together these, you know, these, these sacrifices and, and we would cut them up the middle and split them in half and it would be bloody and we would meet in between them and we'd come in between them and we'd stand there and we would each verbally state what we were agreeing to and then kind of we would shake hands. And the idea here, this is, a, this is seriousness. This is like, this is serious stuff. It's costly, which speaks of seriousness. If I'm, gonna, if I'm going to sacrifice these things on behalf of this contract, I'm serious. I'm very serious about this. And, 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 uh, and it was ugly. It was bloody. I mean, for us to enter into this kind of deal, obviously, it was, we were taking a very sober and serious uh, thought about what we were agreeing to. It was, a, it was a promise we were making. It was a contract. Costly and bloody. It meant that two people very serious about what they were agreeing to, that two men would meet in the middle and state their commitment, shake hands, and walk away. And we have a deal. This is a binding contract. Boy, as a pastor, I'm glad that uh, marriages aren't done this way, you know. <laughs> now, when the sun was going down, a sleep fell on Abram, and behold, a horror and great darkness fell upon him. Now, while he, here he is, you've got to understand, God has condescended in a sense. This is my view of this, this particular chapter. God has condescended to Abram and said, all right, you want to know for sure that I'm agreeing to give you this promise, this inheritance, this land, because you asked me, you want to know. So go ahead and bring me, bring me the three-year-old heifer, bring me the three-year-old this, bring me the, the three-year-old that, and so on and so forth, and the birds, and they didn't cut the birds in half, but they laid them on the side. And, and now here's Abram, he's waiting for God to come, to stand in the middle with him, so that they can make this agreement. This is, Abram's waiting for the contract, and while he's waiting, the vultures come, and he has to beat the vultures away, and and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and it gets so late that Abram just falls asleep. And God causes a nightmare to fall on Abram. And, and then this is what God says to Abram. Listen, verse 13. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. They will afflict them 400 years. So get the scene here, okay? Abram is, is like, I'm making a contract with God, right? And so, you know, he's waiting and waiting, waiting for God to come. He's beating back the vultures. God, you know, allows, waits for him to fall asleep, causes this dream and starts to give him a vision of the future. About, we know what this is, obviously. This is, the, this is his descendants that he's promising him. It's all about the agreement, the contract. 
those descendants will, will go into captivity in Egypt, amen? And then, and then we know that many other things will happen. Your descendants will be like strangers in a land that's not theirs and will serve them and they will be afflicted 400 years. Now, before we go any further in this, some of you maybe have heard that there's a contradiction in Scripture here because Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 says that the so sojourn of the people of Israel, God's, uh, Abram's descendants, that they lived in Egypt was 430 years, and that's repeated one other place as well. But if you go back to verse 13 in this nightmare that Abram's having while he's waiting for God to come, it says 400 years. Well, where's the other 30 years? Well, specifically what God is talking about there is that they'll be afflicted 400 years. 400 years of affliction. Because the first king of Egypt, when they went down there, was a friend of the people of God, right? And then when he finally goes off the scene after 30 years of Abram's descendants dwelling in Egypt, a king arises, a pharaoh arises, who is no friend of the descendants of Abraham. So let's go on. Verse 14. Abram's having this dream. God's explaining it to him. And also the nation whom they serve, Egypt, will I judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. This is what the dream means, Abram. Your descendants that I'm promising you that you're going to have, that are going to outnumber the stars, those descendants are going to go into captivity in a place called Egypt. For 400 years, there's going to be affliction, and then they're going to come out of there, and after four generations, they're going to return to the land that I promise you. And it's not ready yet because the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet been complete. Interesting there. God's going to judge the Amorites, but not before the hearts of the Amorites has gotten to a point of no return. You ever notice this principle in Scripture? God is so long-suffering and patient. He could have brought about these things much sooner but he doesn't. He says the heart of the Amorites is still not gone so far. I, I kind of get the sense that the Amorites, you know, were give, being given some mercy and God was being patient with them, giving them an opportunity to turn. And it came to pass, verse 17, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven, a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Abram's still waiting for God to come down. He'd fallen asleep. He's seeing this vision. God is giving him definition of the things that he's seeing in his horrible dream. And in the meantime, while Abram is sleeping, God comes and consumes the contract instead with a covenant. God consumes the contract with a covenant. Abram asked for a contract with God. God says, you want a contract? Go ahead. You cut the pieces in half. You separate them. You spend all that time beating back the vultures, the, those worldly creatures that have come to pick at the meat. You tire yourself out. And when you finally get tired of trying to uphold your end of the bargain, I'll come consume your contract and I'll give you a covenant. This is so like us, isn't it? When we want to obtain righteousness in our life, when we want to move to the next level, when we want more holiness. Or even when we just want anything out of life, we seem to have this tendency to make deals with God. Well, Lord, I'll do this. This is my end, and, and then you'll do this end. And, and, we, and we, we work, and we work, and we work, and we try to fulfill our end, and God sits back and He waits till we fall asleep. And then He comes and He consumes our sacrifice, and He says, no, no, no. I've made a promise. It's based on my word. It's not based on your performance. God consumes Abram's contract and replaces it with a covenant. God's not going to make a deal with you that's dependent on your performance, especially when His great plan, His sovereign plan, is dependent on the outcome. It's too important. God will not depend on you for the outcome of His promises. He will never enter into a deal with you that's dependent on your ability to uphold your end of it. And so God comes and He replaces Abram's contract with a covenant. You see, a covenant is different than a contract, right? A covenant is where the person entering into the covenant and making the promise 
is saying, I'm going to perform this regardless of your performance on your end. And that's why we, when we do marriage ceremonies, we're very clear with the, the couples that are getting married. We say, listen, you're not entering into a contract. You're entering into a covenant. You're agreeing that what God has said in His Word is your end of the deal. And you're agreeing that you should be held to that standard regardless of the performance of the person entering into the covenant with you. And that's what God is doing here for Abram. He's entering into a covenant. He's making a promise that has no relevance as to the performance of the recipient, in this case, Abram. Verse 18, on this same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I have given this land. Now listen to this. Listen to this. I, I want you to imagine this in your mind or turn to your maps in the back if you want to picture this. I want you to look at the, the borders that God has set for the promised land of, the, of Israel. It says here, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. That, those borders, that is the Nile River, okay, to the south, and the Euphrates River to the north and to the east. And of course, we know we have the, 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 you know, the whole the gulf there off to the west. And so there's, there's your picture. That's supposed to be Israel. In your mind, can you ever imagine or have you ever, do you ever remember a time that the Jews have possessed all that land? Absolutely not. Yet God said that that is theirs and, and he's going to, and now he further defines it. He says here in verse 19, the Kenites, the Kinesiites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Parisiites, and the Rephium, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This is all the region that God has promised to give to Israel. And this, by the way, is the source of the great geopolitical conflict that exists in the world today. The very center of all the world's problems are in this place that's being outlined here. God has promised it to Israel, and the Arabs now want it. We, and we learned last week, and we're going to see next week, how, how the birth of, of the, the Arab nations from the descendants of Ishmael, human effort to pre perform God's work, we're going to see that next week. Abram wavers in his faith. Sarai wavers in her faith. And, and we're going to see how this land is, is fought over and we're seeing that today, aren't we? How this land is fought over. And it's the source of great conflict in the world today. And it's the source of a lot of problems. And this land was promised to the Israelites. Now God has begun to give it back to them. We know in 1948, uh, 46 or 48? 48. Israel became a nation again. And they have their land. And yet over and over again we see people trying to take that land away from them again. The Palestinians are trying to take the land away from them, claiming that it's theirs. And the nations around them are trying to take more and more of their land. Russia wants part of the coastline. Iran and Iraq want to encroach, encroach upon their land. And it's not theirs. It it's, belongs to Israel. It belongs to the descendants of Abram. Hebrews 8 says this, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then there'd be no place or no, they would have, not, there'd be, would have not been sought for a second. This old covenant that Abram hasn't even yet been introduced to uh, is completely different from the new covenant that Abram is now learning about. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of works lest anyone should boast, Paul said. The new covenant is obtained by grace through faith and the relationship that we have with God of sanctification in which He changes us is obtained also by grace through faith. The land that Israel is going to possess is going to be obtained by grace through faith. We're going to see that happen, I believe, in the millennial reign. Paul also wrote about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in Galatians, where he said this, What purpose then does the law serve? If the law is not perfecting us. If we can't be perfected by fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law, well, then what purpose is it? Of course, he's asking a rhetorical question. He says this, it was added because of transgression till the seed 
should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, the, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promise of God? Certainly not. If there had been a law given, listen to this, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have come by the law. If Abram could have done this on his own, then God would have met him. If he could have performed righteousness on his own, God would have met him there and completed the contract with him. If, if God could have made a great nation on his own without God's help, Sarai would, would not have been barren. But as we're going to see next week, she is and was. Paul also said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. For all the promises of God in him, in Jesus, are yes, and in him, Jesus, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us is with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Doesn't that fill your heart with warmth and joy to know that it's not up to, to you to perform righteousness in order to obtain a relationship with God, in order to maintain a relationship with God more accurately? You can't work for your relationship. The promises of God in Him are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. It is God that perform, performs it, and it is He who will complete it until the Christ Jesus. Amen? Where are we at? Worship team, make their way forward. If you've been working for your relationship, if you think you've entered into a relationship through work, let Abram's example, let verse 6 in chapter 15 be an example for you because righteousness is not something to be achieved. It's something to be believed. Who remembers, you don't have to raise your hands, but do you remember promise keepers? Anybody remember promise keepers? I see a lot of heads shaking. In fact, you can raise your hands. Who went to promise keepers? Anybody? I thought we'd have some people that went. We have a few people that went to Promise Keepers. Now, on one hand, you look at Promise Keepers and you say, well, that was a, I'm sure that was a, you know, something that God probably delighted in. Here's what was, how many men went to some of them. I mean, there were millions over the various ones that went, but I think at one point there was a, like a million that attended maybe one of them. But amazing thing. How many men do you think there made sincere commitments to make radical changes in their life. A lot, I'm sure, right? Probably some of us know people that went to a promise keepers and made radical commitments to the Lord to, make, to keep promises, right? How many today do you think have actually fulfilled those promises? Probably none. Probably every one of them have failed in some way, form, or fashion in keeping those promises. And how many of them who've made those promises do you think have felt bad about not keeping those promises? Probably everyone who, who's failed in keeping those promises. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's the very thing that'll keep you from going back to church at times, where you've made commitments to the Lord. You've made promises to the Lord. Lord, if you do this, I'll do this. God's sitting back, and he's going to wait for you to wear yourself out. Go ahead. Keep beating back the vultures. That's what you want to do. Cut the animals in half. Stand there. Beat back the vultures. I'm going to wait till you fall asleep, and then I'm going to come and consume your sacrifice until you're ready to believe that I'm going to keep promises, and you can't keep promises. One of my favorite teachers when I was at Calvary Chapel Bible College a man by the name of Bob Hoekstra said, don't be a promise keeper, be a promise believer. And then he would go like this. <laughs> he had this big smile. Awesome guy. Don't be a promise keeper, be a promise believer. Why is it so important that we know the promises of God? Because if God said it, it's going to come to pass. God said he wants to impute his righteousness into you and into me. Our belief in that is what's going to change us. But sometimes we have a tendency to say, no, it's been so many years that I've just learned to live with this sin and this compromise, and maybe this is just how I'm going to die. And he's done other things in my life. That's good enough. 
I'm good just how I am. But God doesn't want you to be there. God doesn't want you to be content in your current unrighteousness. He wants to make you righteous. He wants to make you like His Son. So let's all stand and let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to consume our contracts with covenants and to perform His righteousness in and through us. Let's pray.